You guys ready? Let's stand up. Let's sing. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens. And he floods above the sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. For his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. They were made at His command. Then forever He established. His decree shall never stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons all. Fire and hail and snow and vapors. Stormy winds that hear him call, and let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thankful for your presence here. Thanks for coming on in and letting us get started. We are looking forward to good things this morning from uh, Dr. Money. I, I hope, uh, by the way, is anybody else's weakness in the morning pastries? Yeah, and, and t today was just terrible, wasn't it? So, <laughs> but uh, it's a good stuff, and, and we're, we're glad that you're here and came early to, to greet and to get to see each other. Royce Money is a, I, I grew up in Temple, Texas, and Royce Money is kind of a living legend there. He's the, the boy from home who, who did well. And uh, so in a certain extent, Royce, I've been chasing you all my life. Although Royce had graduated and gone on before I ever got there, but he uh, was still a, a local legend. His father and his uncle were elders at the church, and uh, they were very much part of my life and a joy for me to uh, interact with in, in so many different ways in reality. Um, Royce has been preparing for ministry all of his life. I don't know exactly what in Temple kind of pointed you that direction. Maybe James LaFan had something to do with that. Um, but Royce went to ACU and got a Bible degree. It is at that time in 1964, the summer between his undergraduate and his graduate education began, that he came to the Lake Jackson Church of Christ and as he told you last night, learned how to be a church secretary, which every good minister needs to, to learn how to do. He went back to ACU and got his Master's of Marriage and Family Therapy, he then also completed a Master's of Divinity and eventually uh, earned a PhD in church history. Uh, that's significant to me because uh, my daughter, when she went to ACU, Royce was the president at that time. After he stepped out of the president's office, he started teaching a January church history course, which Drew got to take and loved every minute of that. He was the president of Abilene Christian University from 91 to 2010. Um, and in that time, he led the university in such a powerful sort of way grew it in so many different aspects, and particularly what I loved about it is that the students walking across campus loved to walk up and talk to Dr. Money and to say hi to him. That continued after he stepped out and Drew was there. Again, people came up and I think even would walk up and say, Royce, how are you today? Um, 
I don't want to take up any more of his time uh, because I think he's got great things to say. He has been an observer of the church, this congregation from 1964, but all the years since then. And we're looking forward to what you have to say. Why don't you join me in prayer as we begin. Our Father and our God, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather in your name. We're thankful for the opportunity to open our hearts to your direction. We're particularly grateful this morning for the opportunity to think about the church and the, the track that it's on and what proclaiming the gospel and being the people of God is going to look like in the years to come. We'd ask that you would guide Royce's words and that we would hear you speak through them. And in hearing your word, that we would be changed. We pray this in the name of Jesus and we all say, Amen. Royce. It's wonderful to be back in Lake Jackson, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed last night learning a little bit more about the history of the church than I knew, certainly, and it was just, it was just great. The topic that Alan asked me to talk about was, uh, uh, at this juncture, 75 years, it's a great time to uh, take a look forward and see what's coming down the pike, and to do that we have to measure church trends, and to do that, the church historian in me just has to add how we got here just a little bit. And uh, so we'll try to do all of that in a compact uh, period of time. But it's, uh, you, you helped, and your community leaders helped me teach this lesson last night, just by listening uh, to what they said, and by the tremendous influence you have uh, in this community. Let's uh, figure out, first of all, kind of how we got here. I'll start with kind of the American uh, expression of what came to be known as American Restoration Movement. It was born out on the frontier uh, in western Kentucky and other places. Uh, Cane Ridge Revival in 1802 was uh, one of the marker events, but you begin to see a lot of ferment on the frontier, people examining uh, the fact that uh, uh, Christianity is so divided, and so to put it uh, uh, plainly, that some dissatisfied Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists basically said, uh, let's drop all of the creeds, let's just follow simple New Testament Christianity, and let's take unity seriously. I want you to notice that they recognize that unity is a serious doctrine of the Bible. And so, uh, the movement began to grow. There were merging of movements uh, across the uh, U.S. The uh, Stone uh, uh, group and the Cam uh, Campbell group came together, and it was quite a quite a scene. Uh, quite a bit of growth until the Civil War came along, and uh, the Civil War has had its uh, after effects on church life uh, for decades and maybe even centuries. Because you begin to see after the Civil War, between there and, and uh, 1900, kind of a north-south divide. And uh, those in the southern part were tending to be more conservative. Remember now, there were, I'm making generalizations here, generally the people without. They were the people on the other side of the tracks. And uh, the people in the north out of that movement uh, were people that still had their church buildings. And uh, they had, uh, they, they were began to be more influenced by progressive thinking. And so you begin to see what began as a unity movement beginning uh, to divide a little bit. So by 1906, the U.S. Census Bureau, who counted religious affiliation back then, uh, for the first time listed Churches of Christ, as we would know them, and uh, Disciples of Christ, or Christian churches, as they were known then, uh, as two separate religious bodies. Uh, then there, were, there was a period uh, in which we know amazingly little about our history in the early 1900s. We don't really see it begin to emerge too much until the 30s and 40s. Uh, the disciples of Christ um, were, were all, always theologically more uh, progressive, and uh, as uh, the effects of, of uh, European um, liberal, uh, liberalism had its effect on them, they in turn began to split. And uh, I kind of lived through this because my maternal grandfather, W.G. Whitlow, uh, attended First Christian Church 
in Temple, Texas. I live with my grandparents and my mother and dad. And in the uh, 50s, I would see him go to the First Christian Church every Sunday, and my grandmother would go with us to the Church of Christ. So I, I lived through that. And that body split into what is now known as Disciples of Christ, Christian Church. And I think there's uh, a congregation down the street. Uh, and then in the, what we know is independent Christian churches. And uh, Churches of Christ, after, post, after World War II, had their greatest accelerated growth. In fact, uh, there's uh, some evidence, and you, you even saw some documentation, that in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, uh, commentators began to refer to Church of Christ as the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing religious uh, groups in America. Uh, keep that in mind because that didn't last very long. We're now doing some serious research. There are five or six uh, people who are involved in some of these projects. I'm marginally involved in the projects. And one of the things that they are beginning to uh, discover is that probably since the 1980s there has been a gradual decline. I'm talking about churches of Christ in America in general. Uh, and uh, there began to be a little bit of a decline. There's also evidence that that decline has accelerated just a little bit, enough to where uh, there is quite a bit of, of concern. There's concern about uh, the future. Uh, there are a lot of reasons, and I'm going to list them here in just a minute, uh, why churches increase and why they decrease. They're subject to a lot of different things, and we can't get into that too much this morning. Other than to say, I hope it is not news to you, uh, that uh, in general in America there is increasing secularization. And there is an increasing rejection of what we would traditionally know as organized religion. It's harder to sell to the younger generations. And uh, that should be a point of some concern to us. I remember being shocked about four months ago in the Abilene Reporter News, I'm one of the a few hundred people who still subscribe to the newspaper. <laughs> I, I read it online too, kid. But uh, I love to feel the paper. The front page was a shocker. It listed 10 church properties in Abilene, Texas that were for sale. Number one, property, First Christian Church. One of the, if you've been to Abilene, one of the anchor churches in downtown Abilene. Been there since the late 1900s. For sale. Number two, Grape Street, Fifth and Grape Church of Christ. And it went on down to list the other eight. Uh, and you have to, you have to ask, you know, what happened or what's happening? And I think something like that uh, ought to get our attention. Now, to be sure, there are obvious exceptions. And what I saw last night and what I heard uh, is a very refreshing exception. But why did this happen? Why is this happening? And uh, we've got some uh, evidence that we're gathering here. Here's uh, my little list. There's a decreasing emphasis on evangelism. I have a friend who calls it evangelistic laryngitis. Uh, there is the graying of the church members. You couple that with a, a lack of significant growth, uh, particularly in the 30-year-old and under category. Recent study that uh, some of my friends have made of 50 congregations of the Church of Christ revealed that 40% in the, those 50 congregations were 60 years and older. Almost half those surveyed said they'd been Christians for 40 years or more. Only 3% had become Christians in the last five years. So you begin to see a trend. Another reason I think we're beginning to see some stagnation is lack of church planting of church members consciously or unconsciously also 
um, just submitting themselves to the rising secular cultural values. I think that has to be on our list. By the way, hang on, we're getting to what it takes uh, to grow and prosper and thrive in the future. We're going to do that in just a second. There's an article uh, I picked up by a uh, kind of a burned out preacher, apparently. Uh, <laughs> I guess it happens. But he talks about um, why this is the case. Uh, and he lists reasons. Um, streaming services have affected church attendance. I don't have to go to church. I can listen to my preacher in most congregations, live stream, or I can listen to the, some of the best preachers in the world. I don't even have to listen to my own preacher. How about that? Organizations in the community that once respected Sunday no longer respect Sunday. You see more and more events starting at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, 11. Entertainment has discovered Sunday morning. The NFL games start at 12. And you have uh, sports events being scheduled on Sunday. Then you have everyone who is in a time crunch. And if we uh, in a time crunch, we wait for weekends to get here, hoping we can kind of catch up. And we just run out of time. And every investment, because we're so hurried, has to have a return on the investment, every, uh, everything that we do. And so uh, some people are asking, is going to church worth it? Why am I going? I know the Bible, he says, says we should go. But why should any of us go to church? And he goes back and says, let's go back and let's look and why people sought Jesus out in the first place. Some went for healing, some went for have the demons driven out of them, uh, some went to, uh, to hear what he had to say. Yet when he, was, when he was asked, Peter said, he and the rest of the disciples wouldn't leave Jesus because they knew, quote, Jesus alone had the words of life. That's the only place, that's the only person you can get the words of life. They found in Jesus what they couldn't find anywhere else. And uh, so his point to the whole article is, I'll be sure when people do come to church, they find Jesus. That's a good reminder, isn't it? Perhaps he concluded, instead of focusing on saving the world, the church should focus on finding its own salvation first. I'm convinced when we find Jesus again, the community will find the church again. Interesting. Well, you also have the rapid rise, another reason why we're beginning to see a lot of ferment in our congregations, a rapid rise of non-denominational congregations. Uh, they're largely Bible-based. They're largely conservative in their approach to Scripture and culture. Uh, in fact, uh, when they uh, make the claim to be non-denominational, my, my first instinct is to stand up and say, wait a minute, you can't be non-denominational. That's our thing. <laughs> you can't be Bible-based. That's our slogan. But alas, it's not ours alone. And it never was. I'm aware of a large congregation in the Abilene area. They had a men's retreat about five years ago. A men's retreat, 60 baptisms out of that one men's retreat. You think some lives were turned around? You think some families were united and saved? It's a different world. Um, increased skepticism among younger generations. I'd probably have to list that too. The 30 and under crowd. I hang around them <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, the millennials and the Gen Xers are different. They're, they're proving a little bit more resistant to institutional religion. You may see that in your children and your, uh, and your grandchildren. And let me remind you before we leave this and go on to the future casting here. Um, uh, this is happening in every uh, established traditional uh, Protestant group and also 
among the Catholics as well. Now, that's enough down in the mouth. Let's talk about the future. Now, I got to I got to remember something. I remember what the people did to the prophets. You know what they did to the prophets? They stoned them. So I'm leaving it too. <laughs> Save your stoning for Alan or somebody you can catch. <laughs> somebody you can catch, you know. This is the part where I would say if Pam were here, uh, get the car started, you know. <laughs> All right, I've listed five things that I think will really help us uh, to grow and to flourish in the future. Churches who do these five things, I think, have a very bright future in the name of the Lord. Churches, number one, that will grow in the future will need to be more welcoming. That was, uh, by the way, as I already said, so impressive last night. I'm gonna do a little something here, a little audience participation. I need three volunteers. Three, come on up, anybody can do it. Uh, incentive, those who volunteer will get. Oh. Now you, you get this after you do it. All right. Two more, M&M peanuts. 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 All right. All right. You owe me anyway. All right. Okay. Now. Okay. Uh, there, there, there are three words on these. You got to hold them up, guys, to get the peanuts. Okay. All right. Now that's, that's it. Right, right, right about there. Yeah. Uh, how have we practiced? Uh, Evangelism and church growth in the future. Let me rearrange these guys. Um, let's go down here. How's that? Would everybody agree that that's generally an approach? Uh, uh, somebody comes into our midst and we begin to teach them about the Bible and about what it takes to be a Christian. And then we have to work on their lives uh, they have to implement this, they have to show some manifestation in their life that they understand what this is. And then, we're bap you're baptized and then you belong. You get it? In fact, you're on the membership directory. How about that? <laughs> yeah, no asterisk if your spouse is not a member. <laughs> I did that in the 60s and 70s, for which I repented many times. <laughs> okay. Now, let me rearrange these guys. Come on over here. Oh, what would happen if we did this? The directory would be chaos. Directory would be chaos. <laughs> I'm not as near as big a fan of directories as I used to be. Amen. Um, I saw this happen right after Katrina in Abilene. This family, in a panic, escaped all the way to Abilene. They didn't have anything but the clothes on their back. And for whatever reason, they stopped at this church I'm talking about. This congregation of the Church of Christ. And, for whatever reason, I don't know, these, well, I do know this, these people just outpoured their love. They, they, they found a place for these people to live. They got them clothes. They got them everything they needed. They even helped the man find some part-time work to get some income. And lo and behold, one Sunday, they came to the front and said, we are so impressed with this church, we want to be members of this church. The existential moment of the preacher and the elders. And they responded so beautifully, I could just hug their neck. They said, we welcome you into this church. We want you to be a part of this church. You're a part of this church family. We look forward to learning more about you and sitting down and studying God's word together and living together and helping you and your family to grow and to prosper. Welcome. 
Now, six months later, the whole family was baptized. Today, this man is on a committee of a few people to help the, uh, that uh, plans the adult curriculum of the church. Now, if we had done it the old way, I think they'd have been gone. Now, does this make uh, some of us nervous? Yeah. Except that people today are looking for a place to belong. I want to know before I commit whether you accept me or not. Now, if I'm going to come in on probation, maybe I'll go on down the street where I'm not. Uh, one of my church, uh, churches in Abilene has a downtown uh, group they call Freedom Fellowship. And uh, there are people, a uh, wide variety of people, but for many of them, they're kind of down on their luck. They're going through a crisis, they have one thing or another. And, and church down there is a little loosey goosey, as they say. <laughs> it's a little more flexible than it is at the big church. There's a lot more confession, there's a lot more, probably a lot more honesty, if you don't know the truth. And uh, there's acceptance. Uh, all I'm saying is, uh, to uh, toy around with it. You guys did great. Let me get the M&Ms for you now. All right. I'm convinced that M&M peanuts are the food of the gods, because <laughs> I have a big crystal jar in my office. If any of you send your children or grandchildren to ACU, you can come by and get one. Okay, that's number one. Number two. Churches that will grow in the future will have the courage to re-examine how gospel, our gospel message is. Now have no doubt about it, the core tenets of the gospel do not change. But hear me out, our understanding over time of that gospel does change. Through circumstance, through time, through cultural understanding. I'll ask you quickly, does your understanding of what the basic tenets of the gospel, has that changed in the last 20 years? 30 years, 40 years, 10 years? I've already apologized to all the youth group that was here last night in my 1964 youth group. I have a much deeper concept of uh, what the grace of God means today than I did uh, 40, 50 years ago. I have a greater appreciation for the price that Jesus paid for the sins of the world, for my sins. Now the gospel hasn't changed. But I've changed. I have a greater tolerance today for those who see the gospel a little differently than I do. I'm more prone to start with the similarities and then work to the differences rather than start with the differences and try to scramble around and find the similarities. I just know this about human nature. Most of us for decades have done our worshiping, structuring, and believing in ways that we've found to be agreeable and comfortable. We've justified what we have done by claiming we were following a New Testament pattern. But I've noticed that traditions Customs, personal preferences have a funny way of slipping into doctrinal absolutes, sometimes with little room for tolerance for re-examination. Anyone who's done international travel and mission work uh, taught me that in the one universal body of Christ, there are many expressions, not just my American viewpoint. I was blown away by uh, being a guest at a Church of Christ in Accra, Ghana. I took my two sons-in-law and my oldest grandson with me. We were doing some consulting to get a Christian college started over there. Went to church on Sunday and I was blown away. This church has 1,600 members. Um, 
their building, their downtown uh, a permanent church is now in operation. It wasn't at the time. And uh, in the church, architects, lawyers, physicians, engineers, all kinds of professional and uh, uh, skilled people, and they, uh, in, in African style, they just build till the money runs out, and then they wait, and then they build some more, and now they're in the, they're, you're in the building. That day was Missionary Sunday Day, and so, uh, well, for one thing, I preached 25 minutes. I thought I did a fair job. Sat down, and the, the real preacher got up, didn't think I'd preached enough, and preached for 40 more. Uh, cultural difference. 24 missionaries came to the front of the auditorium after the preaching. And it was Mission Emphasis Sunday. And they were in five, in, in, in throughout Ghana and in five other countries. Now, Ghana is separated roughly. The northern half is predominantly Muslim. The southern half is predominantly Christian of some sort. And so I naively leaned over to my host and I said, how many of these missionaries does this church support? And he looked at me like, I was crazy. And he said, all of them. Yeah. All of them. Well, maybe you know Church Christ that's uh, got 24 full-time missionaries. I, that's the only one I know about. And it's uh, several thousand miles away. I learned a little humility after that. Uh, methods of evangelism will tend to change on us. Um, my list grows shorter, I must confess, of what I call the essential elements of the gospel that I have to believe and uh, seek others to believe. One more thing, our secular culture is throwing believers in Jesus in uh, uh, all different religious traditions. I think it's I think our secular culture is throwing us together more. You caught a little bit of that uh, last night. There's so many things we can do together with other people who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ. To be sure, let me be clear, doctrinal uh, beliefs do matter. But so does unity. Uh, unity was the one great doctrine that Jesus chose to dwell on in his prayer in John 17, the last night before he was crucified. Um, what are we, number three, I think now? Churches who will grow in the future will show to the world that salvation is not just about the afterlife, it's also about this life. It has a message and it has an action uh, regarding the broken and struggling people of the world. And uh, it was evident to me last night that uh, the people in this community fully recognize the great impact this congregation is having here. Salvation is about freedom from addiction. It's freedom from destructive and sinful habits. Salvation has relevance to marriages, to family life, to living as a single person. We're saved to do something, not just saved from something. Uh, number four, churches that will grow in the future, I'll just, will bloom where they're planted. <laughs> um, will have a local influence. Once again, I make reference to our time together last night, where you have the mayor and the superintendent of schools and the county commissioner coming in and the state representative coming in and expressing appreciation and gratitude for the way you have served in this area. That is most unusual. By, what I, uh, by this I'm, I mean they'll pay attention to the needs of their community, their neighborhood, the area of the world. However you're going to define that. 
You remember uh, one of the most penetrating parables of Jesus, and he had a bunch of them, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, one of the Pharisees came up to him, and uh, text says, Luke 10, that he was trying to uh, trick Jesus. He said, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus turned it back to him. He said, you know the law. What does it say? Well, it says, love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said, that's right. So do it. Go do it. And this guy, uh, feeling the pinch, wanted some wiggle room and said, uh, and, uh, but, but, but who is my neighbor? And boy, there was a lot hanging on that question. Jesus tells this story. You know the story. Man going from Jericho. He's overtaken by thieves. This was common in the day. Lay bleeding in the ditch. Priests passed him up. A Levite passed him up. The religious establishment of the day. Jesus is really prodding the religious establishment. And then the guy that nobody thought anything about. Whoever, put, whoever you want to put in your category, uh, the one in society that you think is probably the most despised generally, you put that in the place of the word Samaritan. This guy was a reject. He stopped, he helped the guy, took him to an inn, and provided money for him, and said, if that's not enough, my next trip through, I'll pay you uh, the full amount. And who is my neighbor? Who was neighbor to the man? Well, well, I guess the one that helped him. Uh, I think that parable is as relevant today as it, as it ever was. Churches are who succeed in the future are churches who do a really good job of figuring out who their neighbor is. Um, One more. Churches uh, grow and succeed in the future will have a really good idea of who Jesus is. And that sounds simple, maybe even simplistic to you, but it is so easy to be Jesus followers and talk about a lot of other stuff and forget what the demands of discipleship are. Personal discipleship, corporate discipleship, uh, we have to keep coming back. And for us to uh, legitimately retain the name Church of Christ uh, implies that we are a church who is dedicated uh, to the ways and the teaching and the will of Jesus. I think to come back to the simple doctrine that He is the Son of God, that He came to earth to save us from our sins. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross. He was raised, and He has ascended to the Father. He's, he's our Savior despite our sinful nature, uh, if we follow His teaching and example. He's the one who said that hell itself couldn't keep His message and His church from being spread all over the world. And so my prayer for this church is that you will continue in the ways that you have for 75 years. Uh, this church does have a unique DNA. Chris was right last night. You've heard it from so many people. It has a unique DNA. This church set me on a trajectory of my life of ministry that I will never forget. This church has launched a lot of people, a lot of missionaries, a lot of preachers, a lot of people who have impacted the kingdom of God. It's my prayer that in the next 75 years, don't ask me back, but in the next 75 years, <laughs> don't dig me up to just bring me back. I'll be fine. I hope somebody will say in this place or someplace else, 
Lake Jackson Church of Christ has been faithful to its commission to be the church of Jesus Christ. God bless. So it was wonderful to be here and hear Royce. I was actually in college with Royce, uh, far, far behind him, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's great, great to have you here speaking to us, uh, inspiring us, really. So uh, there's going to be time between the, the class and the, the, uh, the services. Uh, you can have more refreshments and coffee. Um, now see, that's how we've changed, because I, I remember people frown at me when I'd walk in here with a coffee cup. You can bring that in if you want. Uh, but we're, then we'll meet back in here when the lights blink, so just, uh, just be watching for that. We're going to have a, a prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss for this morning. Father God, we're so thankful to you for our faithful men like uh, Royce Money. We're so thankful for the heritage of faith that has been in this congregation and the people that have have come before us and have influenced us. And we're so thankful, Father, for the future that you've promised. And we, we pray, Father, that we'll keep our eyes on Jesus and try and become more like him. Help us to be inclusive and loving and serving. Father, help us to be what Jesus was more and more. Thank you, Father, for all you're doing for us this weekend, for all you promised and all you'll do for us in the future and the salvation you've given us through your resurrected Son. In his name we pray. Amen.